My name is Rick Dietzman. I'm the minister to adults here at the church. And today we're going to explore a little bit more what freedom is for. Now, as many of you know, I've lived in a, a lot of different countries overseas, or I've traveled to many different countries and various places in my life. And one of the things I've noticed in traveling or in living in those places is, is there is a desire for freedom. I think uh, what we've seen in the news this year demonstrates what's been welling up for many years in people's hearts. They're, they're saying on the streets, uh, no more despots. We need real economic freedom. We need jobs. We need democracy. We need basic human dignity. And that is not a cry that originated just this year or a few years ago. It began a long time ago, even with the founders of our, our own country, or before that, when the first immigrants came over in the 1600s. They came because they, they had a desire for freedom. In their case, it was freedom to worship as they desired. And those cries, those desires for basic human freedoms found their way into our, our own country in the, in the Bill of Rights, in the First Amendment, which was added to our Constitution in 1791. And it said, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or of the right of the people to assemble peacefully and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. These are important core values that we have as a country. And as we've already celebrated today, many men and women have died to guard and protect those freedoms. But today I want to talk about something that is even deeper than these five freedoms that are mentioned in the First Amendment. And that is how to have freedom in our spiritual worship, how to be spiritually free. It goes beyond the idea of a freedom of worship. It goes beyond the idea of political freedom. It's how are we spiritually free. There are many people in our country, we live in a, a free country, who are not free. They are bound up inside with fear, with bitterness, with boredom, with guilt, resentment, and they are not free. They're in a, in a free country, but they're not personally free. And yet, the Bible says in, in John 8, if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. What does that mean? What does it mean to be free indeed? Jesus Christ didn't come to make us religious. He came to make us free. And it says in Galatians 5, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. We have the privilege here in our country of celebrating things like the First Amendment rights that we have. But as I said, I've, I've been in many places in the world where those freedoms are not part of people's culture. And yet the freedom that God gives supersedes all of that because it's a deeper freedom that they can experience today and i have watched people's lives transformed with the knowledge of the kinds of freedoms that god gives even in even when they lived in oppressive countries with oppressive regimes they were free and they knew it and today i want to explore with uh, together what is available to us today so that we can live in the freedom that God has promised us. The freedom of God, the freedom of Christ, has four things that it does for us. The first thing is to have a clear conscience. It says in Colossians 1.14, God has purchased our freedom with his blood and has forgiven all our sins. And that means our guilt has been wiped out. That means the, the things that have held us back are gone. Doctors have told us that guilt and resentment are the number one things 
that, that lead to problems in people's lives. They're the two most destructive emotions that people carry. They burden us down when we carry guilt and when we carry resentment. Guilt is what we've done, and resentment is anger about what people have done to us. These both hold us down. And you can't be guilty and happy at the same time. You ever see those signs at the gas station, a clean engine gives more power? Well, that's kind of like what God does for us. When we're cleaned up inside, he gives us more power to live. And we don't need to carry around the guilt any longer. How did that freedom get purchased? Well, Jesus died for us, and he rose again. And that guilt is gone. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians that God will keep you free from all blame on the great day when our Lord Jesus is revealed. He'll keep us free from blame. And I, I think many people think when they, when they get to heaven, there's going to be a big IMAX theater up there with our whole life story there for everybody to see, the good and the bad. And we might get a little embarrassed about what's shown there. But according to this verse, that's not going to happen when we are believers in Jesus. God will keep you free from all blame. There won't be that movie plan with the bad stuff because that is taken care of and that is removed. The guilt is removed and it was paid for at the cross. Now the second great freedom we have through Jesus is to have personal access to God. It says in Ephesians 3, In Christ and through faith in him we may approach God with freedom and confidence. Now, this is a big one, personal access to God. Imagine if you had access to the President of the United States. You could walk into the Oval Office and express your opinion about something. Think about that multiplied now when you think of God, because you're not only approaching God like you might approach the President, but God is called our Father. You don't have to knock on the door. You can just come on in, because Jesus describes God as our Father. That's the kind of access that we are given to God as Christians. And I want you to look at that verse a little more carefully. And if you have a pen or a pencil, I want you to circle, through faith in Him. Through faith in Him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. You see, not everybody gets direct access to God. It's only those who put their faith in His Son, Jesus Christ. That's who gets the access to God. And that access is precious because we can come to God with anything. Any fear we have, any problem we face, any temptation we are going through. It's not the time to flee or to put God away, but it's to say, Lord, I can have free access to you with anything going on in my life. I might be a, go to Costco sometime and be tempted and think, Lord, I'm tempted to buy everything in Costco. I need your help. We can go to God with anything. The simplest things, the more difficult things. Because we have personal access to God. Now these first two are pretty amazing in themselves. That, that our sins are forgiven. That we have access to God. But the third one really, really makes a difference. And that is we live without fear. He set us free from living our entire lives as slaves to the fear of dying. Fear of death is a universal fear for people because everybody dies. But we know when we are trusting in Jesus that we are free from fear because he has conquered death by the cross. And there is no need to be worried about that or to be afraid really of anything. The Bible says, do not fear for I am with you. And we can take every fear we have to God. So many people live in fear. They don't have the assurance that God is with them. And that is a great and powerful freedom. There is, is no fear in love. And love and fear cannot operate in the same time. And the Bible says, fill your life with love and you will have no fear. 
You know, when, we, we, when we're afraid, we are actually choosing to believe a lie. And often that lie comes from Satan. We are not receiving what God says when he says, don't fear, for I am with you. And the, Satan is the father of lies. He, he often lies to us and, and keeps us from knowing the truth. And that's why this fourth thing is so important. And that is to have the power to do what is right. That's the fourth freedom we have in Christ. The power to do what is right. Those who deceive promise freedom, but they themselves are slaves of sin and corruption. For you're a slave to whatever controls you. Now, this is an important point, because a lot of times when people hear the word freedom, they think freedom means no rules. Nobody to tell me what to do. In fact, when the, in the time of the Enlightenment, in the 1700s, there was a, a famous author named Immanuel Kant, who wrote in 1784 about the idea of enlightenment, what that meant. And he talked about the, the emergence from self-imposed immaturity that people had. And he said, immaturity is the inability to use one's understanding without guidance from another. This immaturity is self-imposed when, it, when its cause lies not in lack of understanding, but in lack of resolve and courage to use it without guidance from one another. Have courage to use your own understanding was his idea of freedom. And many people took that idea to heart, and that became their idea of freedom. I can just do what I want with my own mind without guidance from another. The problem with that is that it goes completely counter to what God says. You know, you look at the Old Testament, and a, a number of times in the Old Testament, God says the people of Israel just did what was right in their own eyes. And you know what, got, what that got them? Lots of trouble. Lots of trouble. You see, freedom, when we look at it the way God does, is something completely different. It's not no boundaries, no rules, no regulations, no restrictions, no limits. Freedom is not the absence of limits. Freedom is a power that we have to say yes to the right things and no to the wrong things. We say yes to the right things so that we can grow and we can be a blessing to others, and we say no to the wrong things so they don't trip us up and keep us in bondage. The lack of the ability to say no is called something. You know what it's called? Addiction. Inability to have control, to have compulsions, to have things that, that, that hold us back. And many of us still wonder about that. We have things that, that have held us back for years. That we, we wonder, can God take care of that? Well, the promise of God is very clear in Romans 6. Our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin, for when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. Freedom is power. Now, there are many self-help books that are written every single year. And people buy them by the millions. Self-help books are great. They help you with, with getting some wisdom. They often give practical tools. But self-help books lack one thing to make it better. You know what that is? Power. They lack the power to give us the ability to change. And Jesus says, I've set you free from the power of sin when you trust in me. It's not just us facing our fears, our troubles, our limitations, we now have the God of the universe on our side and helping us in our life. And I want us to look, just as we close, about three things that lead to a life of freedom with this in mind. The first thing is we need to invite the Spirit of God into every situation. When you become a Christian... The Holy Spirit comes into your life and indwells you. And we have that resource there that we didn't have before. That resource of the Holy Spirit needs to be turned on like a light switch. And when we ask Jesus, when we ask God to help us, he enables us 
to have freedom. It says in 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 3.17, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. That still small voice and our response to it gives us freedom. Now, I want you to understand something about this and how it works. Freedom is like a muscle that you develop over time by use. And as you practice the leading of the Holy Spirit and, and listening to God's voice and responding to it, you grow and you enable that yourself to have more freedom. If I was asked to do a brain surgery, uh, I think I'd have a little problem. Now, I could go there and I could say, hey, great, give me those tools, uh, get the anesthesiologist, and let me have at it. But I'll tell you, I wouldn't do very well because I'm not trained, I've never studied, and I don't have the ability to do a brain surgery. When, but the, the thing is with the Holy Spirit is that, that when we practice listening to God and, and responding to him, we are able to grow in our freedom because we get practice at it. And the way you do that is, number two, learn and hold to Jesus' teachings. Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples, and then you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. The way you grow in freedom is to trust in the truth and to obey it. Now, we often like to trust our feelings more than the truth, and we know that. We, we hear what God has for us, but the first thing we do is do what we feel like doing. For example, you hear uh, on Sunday morning, God wants you to tithe, and we think, well, yeah, that's a great idea, but I have these limitations. I, ha I have the bills to pay, or I don't really feel like giving that much. I'll give this. And if we, we hold back and we don't do that, we stay the same. But the minute you start tithing and giving to God, guess what happens? Financial freedom comes into our life because we're obeying what the truth says, and that brings a new power and a new freedom in our life. Same thing with uh, forgiveness. If I've, I've got someone in my life that that I'm really angry with, and I refuse to forgive them. I'm just going to hold on to that bitterness. What will grow? Well, bitterness will grow. A bondage will grow in my life. But if I know what Jesus said about forgiveness, and I, I do that, I approach the person, I begin talking and, and trying to reconcile with them, what comes out of that? Relational freedom. Because freedom is an exercise. The power comes by exercising the right things and doing the right things that God has asked us to do. It's about obedience. Very, very different than the idea of freedom that we've had from the Enlightenment. The more you get of God's truth into your life, the more free you will be. Very different than just make your own decision and do what you want. But the truth of the matter is those who make their own decision and do what they want often don't end up very free. This is the way to freedom. Now the third thing that we do to grow in this freedom is we empower others to be free themselves. God did not create us to exist independently. He created us to be with other people and to help other people and be helped by other people. And that is what he wants us to do. That's why being in a small group is really important. That's why being with other people and getting to know people within the church is so important. Because we need to encourage one another in the truth. Now, I, wanna, I want you to think about what tomorrow will be like. It's the 4th of July tomorrow. What tomorrow will be like if you get up and pray this prayer. You're going to be thinking about freedom again, right? We've, we've already talked about that today. And you get up and you say, Lord, I just want to remember those four freedoms you gave to me. Lord, I thank you that I am completely forgiven. Amazing. You're not going to take all the bad stuff in my life and play it for other people to see. You have forgiven me, and I have access to you as my father. Lord, I, I don't have to be afraid of anything because I know you're with me. And Lord, I thank you that you're going to give me the power to say yes to the right things and no to the wrong things. You know, when the Navy SEALs go in and uh, unlock the door of a, a prisoner who has uh, been kidnapped, what does he do? 
Well, usually they get the keys and they release everybody else that's in the prison as well. And that is the job we are given to do when we understand the true freedom that God has given us. Because Jesus has set us free. And the Bible says very clearly, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but don't use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. It's really all about love and service. And every day, our lives are either getting wider with more freedom to do the right things and grace and love and help to others, or it's getting narrower with more fear or with more judgment or with more a seeking of approval from others instead of God. We're either going one way or the other. And the, we need to look to God and seek him for the true freedom. Now I want you to go back to the first page here and look at the verse that we first started with. Jesus said, if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Our freedom comes from Jesus. Now there are plenty of things out there trying to take away our freedom. Turn us into slaves once again. And we can resist those things. God does not want us to be a captive any longer. But he wants us to be free ourselves and to set others free as well. So will you pray with me? Lord, I, I thank you once again for this reminder that we have today of the freedom that you have given. And this is such a broad subject, Lord but particularly how you purchased our freedom on the cross, forgiven our sins, and given us a free conscience. Lord, I thank you that that involves having access to you, personal access. And Lord, thank you that I am free from fear, and you have given the power to do what is right. Lord, I thank you that you have placed us in a country that values the idea of freedom and dignity. And in times where that idea is distorted to become freedom to do whatever I want, Lord, I pray you would use the, the freedom that you give to serve others. Lord, help us to do that. Lord, as we give our lives away, you will give us more. So, Lord, help us to be your people and to serve one another in love. In Jesus' name, amen.